Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our October webinar, Feeding Our Feathered Friends. Excited to have you join us on this beautiful fall night. Before we get started, I just wanted to go over a couple things related to Zoom. We're all probably pretty familiar, but just in case, when I shared my screen, it probably went full screen for you. So I'm actually going to recommend that you exit full screen. Um, you can find that option at the top of your screen or sometimes hitting escape will get you there. And then the next thing I'm going to recommend you do is open your chat window so it's docked to the side. You're going to look for the little speech bubble icon. And when that opens up, please make sure that you go to the to section and change it from panelists to it'll either say all panelists and attendees or everyone. And that way we can all see what each other have to say as we progress through the webinar tonight. So my name is Kelly and I'm coming to you from Ithaca, New York with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, where our mission is to interpret and conserve the Earth's biological diversity through research, education, and citizen science focused on birds. And I am the outreach coordinator with um, our team, the K-12 education team. And I'm really thrilled to say that this is the first webinar in a long time where a whole team is together. So I'm joined today by Susan Licker and Jennifer Fee, who are our, uh, who with me consist of our K-12 team and they might be in the chat window helping to share links and answer questions. And here on the K-12 team, our mission is to create innovative resources and deliver transformative trainings that empower educators and families to build young people's science skills while inspiring them to connect to nature, explore biodiversity, and engage in citizen science projects. And what we're going to be talking about today, feeding our feathered friends, so feeding birds, is something that really hits all three of those components of our missions, connection to nature, exploring biodiversity, and citizen science. Our K-12 team approaches our mission in kind of a two-pronged approach. So we create curricular resources, including things like simple activity guides, um, online resources for blended learning, and all the way up to full science kits. And we supplement those resources with educator training. So we do professional development, both online and in person when possible. And we really want to try and make sure that you have everything that you need to engage with these materials deeply and get kids excited about exploring the outdoors. In today's webinar, I want to focus on feeding birds. So we're going to talk a little bit about just some of the basics to bird feeding, some tips and tricks to make it a really fulfilling experience for you. We're gonna cover some resources that we have that will help you support learning inspired by these bird, um, birds that come to your feeder. And we're gonna introduce several citizen science projects that will complement bird feeding. So let's get started. I want to throw this question out to you. Why feed birds? This is a really popular pastime in the United States. What do you think is so engaging about feeding birds? Yeah, so you can attract them, you get to watch them, you get to see them up close. You never know what might show up. Absolutely agree, Kathy. I think that is one of the things that really captures our imagination about birds is you know, they migrate, they travel. If you can bring them into you, you can see all sorts of amazing behaviors and species that you might not even know were around otherwise. Bird feeding is a really amazing tool for observing nature up close. It's also really helpful for birds. So this is actually a picture from um, Europe. This is a species of tit. Um, and they 
but the the kind of scenery here captures really well wild bird feeding why bird feeding can help birds so during the winter time when food is scarce and birds can use an extra little pick me up to keep their calories up and help them survive the cold bird feeding is a really awesome supplemental resource that we can provide and there's also benefits for science for drawing birds in and letting us take uh, kind of a survey of their numbers, which we'll talk about more when we get to citizen science. So in terms of education, as you guys brought up, bird feeding brings the birds to you. So it is a way to draw them into you right to your classroom window. You can observe birds. You might not even need extra equipment like binoculars. So it makes birds really accessible and it provides you with an opportunity to observe some really cool behaviors. So it's kind of like this amazing congregation point, all these different species coming to you behaving in interesting ways. And it provides an opportunity to think about birds and their life cycles in a way that we might not get to otherwise. So combining bird feeding and citizen science has a lot of benefits for educators. It's exciting in real world. It provides you with an opportunity to get to know some of your local wildlife. It's a relatively low cost, high impact activity. We know that it helps birds and it can spark a lifelong curiosity and a lifelong connection to local habitats for our students. When I bring up bird feeding and I start, you know, these selling points, sometimes we'll get teachers coming up to us and saying, okay, this all sounds great, but I just don't have birds on my school campus. To which I say, I'm sorry to tell you, but you're suffering from a very common condition called bird blindness. We've all suffered from this condition at one point or another, but once you start opening your eyes to the birds around you, you'll notice that they are absolutely everywhere. So once you kind of tune into that world, you'll start noticing anything from pigeons and starlings and sparrows to hawks and cardinals and blue jays on your, uh, your campus. And bird feeding is just a really great way to make those birds more apparent. And you can tailor your bird feeding experience to your setting. There are different kinds of feeders out there that will attract different kinds of birds. This image here gives you kind of just a variety of what's out there. So over here in the upper left hand corner, we see a tube feeder. This can be great for some of our smaller birds, tracks anything from finches and chickadees and tip mice to some of our kind of mid-sized birds, um, depending on the size of the feeder. In the lower left hand, we see a really specialized feeder, a hummingbird feeder. But this can be a really awesome um, feeder to put out if you're in the western and southwestern part of the country. Hummingbirds, I think, really capture kids' imaginations. Then in the upper right hand side, we have a suet feeder. So suet's um, a mixture of fat and seed and other things that is great for our insectivorous birds, things like woodpeckers. Um, you'll see nuthatches, you'll see chickadees and things like that on there as well. If you do have um, blackbirds uh, coming through, you might see a lot of starlings hanging off of that as well. And then all the way to the right, we have a hopper feeder. This is great for your bigger birds like blue jays and morning doves, um, cardinals, things like that. And then this blue jay that we're looking at, this is something I would term a platform feeder. Again, great for the bigger birds. And you can kind of see this in action here in these photos, the variety of different birds and food that you can put out to attract what's in your area. So to get the most out of your bird feeding experience, you kind of have to tailor both the bird feeder and the seed. Uh, and there are lots of amazing resources out there to help you. So the Project Feeder Watch website has a really wonderful interactive that will help you explore common feeder birds in your region. So you can choose your region that you are located in. You can look at different feeder types and seed types 
and kind of see which would attract the most birds in your area. So just for an example here, I have a screenshot where we're looking at sea preferences for common feeder birds. You can see that on the left hand side here, we have all different types of seed. And you might see that niger or thistle seed attracts really only finches. Whereas something like black oil sunflower seed attracts the widest variety of species, chickadees, nuthatches, finches, and so on. So you can, if you know you have a ton of finches and that's really what you wanna attract, you could try niger. But if you wanna see the widest variety choosing black oil sunflower seed would be a great thing to do. And then you'll also see often in bird stores seeds that have a lot of different mixes in them. And so this is uh, the feeder bird interactive there that I recommend you check out. Susan has shared the link to this in the chat window. So you'll be able to play along with it. Definitely recommend you spend a little time poking through that. As you can see here, it does a really great job of breaking things down. Here's what we were talking about with different seed preferences. So I have this region here set to all for all over America, and then I have Milo seed selected and any feeder type. And so you can see the amount of birds that would come to that set of parameters. And then you can see the same set of parameters, but for black oil sunflower and that the species numbers are more than doubled. So you can make some choices based on that information. When it comes to feeders, there are all sorts of different ways of approaching it. There are store-bought feeders, of course, but you can also make your own feeders. Um, so you can do anything from the classic pine cone and peanut butter rolled in seed or pine cones and Crisco rolled in seed to soda bottle feeders where you stick through wooden dowels and cut a little hole above it for feeding and you can recycle materials in that way. We do have some plans for um, makeable feeders on our website, including uh, the ones that you see here like fun seed cakes that you can put out at different points of year. And Susan just shared a link to that blog post in the chat window. As part of attending this webinar, you're also gonna receive a link to this awesome window bird feeder from our friends at Pennington Wild Bird Food. Um, they are supplying these feeders to us and we can send them to you for just $6 shipping. Um, they and we unfortunately this is going to be limited to the United States and to schools or educational nonprofit addresses. This is just so that we can keep our shipping costs uh, in a reasonable amount and also to fulfill that kind of mission we have to make sure that we're serving as many students as possible with these feeders. Now, when I talk about window bird feeders, what's so great about these feeders is it really brings the birds into your window. You don't need to worry about binoculars. You're gonna get amazing looks at these birds that you're bringing in. But a lot of people express concerns about window collisions, which is something that we definitely need to be thinking about. But I wanted to put your mind at ease by sharing this study with you. So a study looked at feeder placement and collisions um, and you can see here on the graph that we have our distances from one meters to 10 meters. So the deadliest collision zone is actually about five meters to 10 meters. So 15 to 30 feet, which is where I think a lot of us kind of want to put our bird feeders, right? A good distance away so you can kind of see everything that's going on. When the safest collision zone is actually closer to the window. And this is because Birds tend to hit windows and fly into windows when they are startled and they're looking for kind of an escape route and they are just going at whatever looks like a safe area. And because windows will often reflect back either the scenery around them or if they can see through to the other side of the building, that looks like a safe place to go. They've hit, built up a lot of momentum. They can really hurt themselves. But if they're much closer to the window, they haven't really built, built up enough momentum to really hurt themselves. So they might tap the window 
but they're not really going to do a lot of damage. So these window bird feeders are putting you, you know, pretty much in that safest collision zone for your birds. And by sticking the, the feeder to the window, you're kind of providing them with something that breaks up the reflection and helps them see the window better. You are interested in learning more about window collisions. Um, you should check out seven simple actions, which I will talk about more at the end and we'll share a link to that later. All right, now, <laughs> if you have fed birds for any amount of time, you've probably encountered this nemesis, the gray squirrel. Um, <laughs> At my very first job in school, in gosh, high school, I guess, was working at a Wild Birds Unlimited and I selling bird seed to people. And I think that the thing I heard most about were these little uh, critters who were eating up all their seed, gray squirrels. So they can kind of be a nemesis. They're really clever. They're good at getting into feeders and they will eat you out of house and home. But there are some tips and tricks that can help you reduce their impact on uh, the amount of seed that they're eating. So some people really enjoy feeding squirrels. Um, some people put cracked corn out for them in a different area, so they'll eat that instead of coming to their bird seed. But if you're trying to do um, a study on birds specifically, you might want to limit the amount of seed that they're eating. Uh, one of the ways to do that is by using a baffle. So there are two different kinds that are pictured here. One is if you have your bird feeder on a pole, you can do this kind of bell style baffle or you'll see a tube style baffle that's similar that prevents them from climbing up the pole. Um, another style is kind of the one that goes over top so they can't climb down onto the feeder if it's hanging from a branch. The challenge here is that squirrels are incredibly acrobatic. So they can jump about 10 feet from any surface. So it can be a challenge to find a place where squirrels can't access. I think some of, some of the folks who have used our window bird feeders have actually had pretty good luck with the squirrels having challenges getting onto those. But, Squirrels, as I said, are resourceful and a little tricky. So even with the baffle, you might find that they figure a way out. So you might have to uh, play around a little bit with your feeder placement. If you are interested in more information about how to prevent squirrels from eating all of your bird seed, there is a bird note that talks about um, some tics, tips and tricks for managing that. And Susan is going to share a link to that in the chat window. So now I want to jump into some resources. If you're excited about feeding with birds and you want to make sure that you're doing some robust education around it, we do have a ton of resources to support that. The first thing I want to highlight for you are our free educator guides. These are detailed guides um, that provide lessons and activities around children's trade books. So there are some really great ones um, about learning to identify birds like Crow Not Crow that can be really useful when you are starting a unit on birds and you want to get kids excited about learning bird ID. All of these guides are aligned to NGSS and Common Core State Standards for um, ELA and math. They are also split into grade bands. So if you're looking for them on our site, you would first search for the proper grade band and then um, choose free educator guides. The next lesson I want to highlight for you is our Feathered Friends download. This is a really fun resource, a great way to kind of get to know birds. And um, again, this is supported by our friends at Pennington who are providing the uh, window bird feeders. So if you lose that link, don't worry. If you download this curriculum, you'll get that link sent to you in a follow-up email. Oops. So let's talk a little bit more about this resource. 
It is available as a free download and it incorporates 10 monthly K through five lessons. These lessons have indoor and outdoor components and help you get to know some new local birds every month. And they're really timely. So they're kind of geared toward the time of year. Um, and the themes include things like bird diversity, habitat, flight and migration, conservation, and citizen science. Here's just a glimpse of what these lessons look like. There's an in-classroom part, and then there's um, home connections and little take-home activities for every lesson. Every lesson is NGSS aligned and has this big idea and some learning objectives for you to follow along with. And then it introduces some new birds each month. So you can see here the birds of the month for uh, September and getting to know some bird groups so that you can kind of ease into bird ID. That's probably my biggest tip for bird identification is don't try and know everything at once. Um, what's great about bird feeding is there's only certain birds that are gonna come to your feeders. So you can focus on those species and get to know like 10 or 12 species as a class and be in really great shape for observing the birds at your feeder. And then eventually this uh, set of lessons works up to incorporating citizen science, which is just a really great tool. And we're gonna jump into that more in just a second here, but I wanna go back and cover um, another free resource. So this, this is our Science and Nature Activities for Cooped Up Kids resource, which was created um, and kind of in a response to the pandemic. So it's meant to be a blended resource. So you can use it if you are teaching online, you can download it, you can use it in your classroom. Um, it was designed with both families and educators in mind and articulated across the grade bands. So each activity has a K2, 3, 5, and 6, 8 uh, lesson. Or, and it does, we do our best to, in each one, incorporate independent work with writing prompts and hands-on and outdoor activities. That's um, slideshow based, so kids can follow along um, at, with slides at their reading level and then do some independent activities along with that. Activity nine in particular focuses on feeding birds and it covers things like what do birds eat? How do bird beaks relate to what they eat? And challenges students to engineer their own bird feeder, which can provide you with all sorts of really fun opportunities for exploring different feeder designs and incorporating engineering into your bird feeding unit. Okay. So let's go back to citizen science. Um, I've mentioned it several times today, but we haven't really developed a definition of it. So I would love to know in the chat window, what are some keywords you think of when you hear citizen science, a definition, or even some projects that you've participated in before? Okay, I see giving back to the community. Yeah, citizen science can be very community oriented. Let's see, oh, a great definition here. Everyday people contributing data to science such as an eBird. Yeah, that's a great definition, Kathy, thank you. I like this image when we talk about citizen science, kind of these puzzle pieces forming a globe because I do view it as an opportunity to, for everyday folks like you, me, and our students who aren't professional scientists to help kind of put together the puzzle pieces of our world by sharing our observations of the natural world with scientists. We really do view it as a partnership. And every time I bring up citizen science, I have to share this image with you. When you look at it, it might look like an image of the Earth at night from space. 
like lights lighting up the planet. But what we're actually seeing here is every point of light represents a observation submitted to the eBird Citizen Science Project. The fact that we can see the shape of our world means there's that many people out there who care about birds, who are watching them and sharing what they see with scientists. And what that looks like by the numbers um, is pretty incredible. We've had over half a billion observations submitted to the database. We've had um, more than 10,000 species reported. So actually more than 98% of all the species of birds in the world. So when you, and from every country in the world, we've had reports. And so when you think about what it would take to for a professional scientists to replicate a data set like that, it's just not possible without citizen science. Citizen science is people powered science where our students and folks like you and me get to be the eyes and ears for um, these incredible databases that help us answer important conservation questions. And if you aren't into birds, which I don't know why you wouldn't be, but then again, I am pretty biased. There is a citizen science project out there for you. If your kids are into bugs or plants, or you live on the coast and you wanna record jellyfish, there are projects out there for you. And I highly recommend that you check out um, SciStarter.org, which is an awesome place to find citizen science projects that uh, you can search by your location. So if you wanna find something that's local or you can search by topic. So definitely check that out. The lab has uh, five citizen science projects, and we're going to talk about several of them today. And they all follow kind of a similar protocol. So first, you're getting outside, you're identifying and observing data, you're collecting that data, you're entering that data online. And then what I think is really special about lab citizen science projects is you have access to retrieve and view that data not just your data, but the data that everyone collects. So you get to be part of this big picture. Oh, so one of the things I meant to cover earlier was when should we feed birds? This is a question I get a lot. Um, we should, we run into a lot of people who are concerned about feeding birds during the migration period or summer and they're worried about like throwing off their natural rhythms. There have been studies that have shown that, you know, feeding birds is really treated as kind of, it's a supplemental food source for birds. It doesn't become the only or even primary food source that they rely on. And birds, when they are migrating, that urge is triggered by daylight length more than food availability. So having food available isn't going to stop them from triggering that migration process. So you don't have to really worry about, you know, disrupting the natural rhythm of a bird's life by feeding birds. However, if you want to participate in some bird-focused citizen science projects like Project Feeder Watch, which we're about to dive into, um, the prime time for that, this project runs from November to April. So in that winter time, if you're only going to choose one time of year to feed birds, winter time is kind of the best time to do it. That's when that supplemental food source is really needed the most. <laughs> I love to throw this picture in here because it's pretty amusing to me. This is from uh, a school where they had been feeding birds and then all of a sudden they noticed that no more birds were coming to their feeder. And I wonder if anybody can hazard a guess to why based on what they're seeing in this picture. <laughs> Yeah, the kestrel and the hawk might have something to do with it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so you might have noticed the, this, I think that's a Cooper's or a sharp shin down here. Uh, 
on the railing. And then up here, sitting right on top of one of the feeders is the American Kestrel, a little falcon. So yeah, um, if you encounter an issue like this, the good thing to do when you can take the feeders down for a week or two, your predators will move on to uh, better hunting grounds and then you can put your feeders back out. All right, so if you wanna make your observations at your bird feeders really matter, citizen science is a really powerful way to do that. So there are a number of projects that you can participate in. One is the Great Backyard Bird Count. This is a four day event that takes place mid-February every year. This year is from February 18th to the 21st. Um, and it's usually around, is it President's Day weekend? Um, so it's kind of a, falls across Across a weekend. So it can be a little challenging to do at, as a school group, but um, it's something that you can kind of prep for kids to do. And you can watch birds in your backyard, in your neighborhood, from your balcony, at a local park, anywhere. Um, and this four day snapshot of birds is useful for us to have because we've been doing this for, oh gosh, a long time now. And it helps us kind of get this snapshot of our winter bird distribution. I've mentioned Project Feeder Watch, so let's dive into this project a little bit more. Um, you can learn more about Feeder Watch from feederwatch.org. And this is one of the longest running uh, citizen science projects at the lab. It has a really great history and reaches folks of all different age groups. There is a small fee associated with this, um, an $18 fee for non-members and a $15 fee for members. But what you get with that is you get um, the feeder watch handbook with all sorts of instructions for the feeder watch protocol. And you get this great uh, common feeder bird poster. So you can have a little ID help for the birds that you might be seeing at your feeders. Feeder Watch is a really awesome project because it does have some different feeder, uh, different protocols, which can be a really great uh, window into scientific protocols and their purpose. So, for example, in Feeder Watch, you only count the highest number of a species that you see at one time. And so what I mean by that is if you have a chickadee who's grabbing a seed and flying away and coming back and grabbing a seed and flying away, you're not counting a new chickadee every time it comes to the feeder. You're just counting one chickadee if that's all you see at a time. But if you see two, two chickadees in the feeder area at a time, then you would count two. Um, and that just helps standardize the count uh, across, you know, we've got so many different people counting. If everybody knows how to count, the data is better data to use for analysis. And this data is really used by scientists. So a number of years ago now, uh, the evening gross beak was experiencing population declines. And data from Project Feeder Watch was among the first to record this decline. And you can see that we're seeing a bit of a decline across several regions. So this was actually a published paper that scientists could use to start thinking about conservation implications. So this data from these projects is really valuable. Another project that you might encounter is eBird. What is wonderful about eBird is that it any bird, anywhere, anytime. Um, so it's not limited to a particular time of year like Project Feeder Watch. Um, if you wanted to count birds on a bird walk any time of year or you know just birds that you see in your schoolyard, um, those would be great counts for eBird. Um, it has its own set of protocols and you can learn about those. Um, it's, it's pretty easy. You can submit data either online or through an app. And it really is 
a project for everyone. So quite a while ago now, as eBird was approaching its hundredth millionth observation, everybody at the lab was wondering who's gonna be the birder to submit this observation. You know, there are folks at the lab who are using eBird multiple times a day, submitting three lists, once when they come in to work in the morning, once while they're on lunch break, once in the evening at home. Um, and everybody kind of thought it would be somebody we knew, but it ended up being, was it, he was 12 year old, Lee Ron, who with the observation of an American Robin. And I love this because it really shows that everybody and every sighting is important. And an uh, American Robin might be a common bird, but you know, one of the mottos at the lab is keep common birds common, right? So every observation helps us understand the state of birds throughout um, our country and throughout the world. What's really great about eBird is you have the opportunity to explore the data here. This is a graph generated um, from eBird data, and it's looking at across the years, do eBirders in Missouri see ruby-throated hummingbirds or northern cardinals more frequently? So on the left, we have frequency of sightings, so that could translate into, if you were to go out during that time of year and do a bird count, what percent chance do you have of seeing this species during that time? And you can see and infer lots of really cool things from this graph. So we can see, for example, from the ruby-throated hummingbird, um, we can see that it hasn't been seen in January through April. So what could we infer about this bird's biology based on this graph? Any ideas? It migrates, absolutely, yeah. So it's only here in April through, uh, looks like mid to early October. So it's a migratory bird. It's just not around in these other periods of time. Whereas the Cardinal hovers around 50% um, throughout the year. So we can infer that that's a residential bird. I always, I find this dip really interesting. There seems to be a dip in the two species in uh, early in mid-June. Anyone have a hazard a guess as to why that might be? Donna's noticing that dip as well, yeah. Nesting, mm -hmm. yeah, that is like prime breeding time right then. And something that happens during that period of time when birds have eggs or young in the nest is that they get super secretive. They don't want to really advertise their comings and goings, right? They don't want to lead predators to their nests. So they might be acting and much more secretive during those times. So that could account for that dip. I see we have a question about molting. You know, that is an interesting question. Birds like these songbirds here, or the hummingbird and the northern cardinal, they molt in a, such a way that they maintain the ability to fly. So they're only gonna molt a couple flight feathers at a time. So they're not like a goose, for example, that's gonna molt most of their flight feathers when they're young are in that downy stage and can't fly because they can't, why the adults don't need to fly if the young can't fly either. Um, so I don't know if molting would account for uh, uh, detecting birds less because they should still be able to kind of carry on with at least these two species with their daily activities. It'd be really interesting to learn more about how molting affects uh, birds being sighted, though. It's an interesting question. Another thing that feeding birds allows us to do is embrace a really cool opportunity to encourage student inquiry. 
So by bringing in the birds to us, we're provided with the chance to ask lots of cool questions. And one of the things that you notice when you start feeding birds is kids are gonna just naturally start asking a lot of questions and some of them can be turned into cool studies. We do have a free curricula that can, excuse me, curriculum that can support you in this. So investigating evidence is all about scaffolding the inquiry pro process. Um, and you can download that curriculum for free from our website. And it kind of walks you through how to approach inquiry projects based on natural observations or observations of the natural world, I should say. And here are some studies and a couple examples that I wanted to share with you. You can approach these studies um, appropriate for all sorts of different grade levels. Um, this one is from a seventh grader who is curious about whether birds prefer feeders on a pole or a tree. And you can see kind of the first graph here where you could take a really um, simplified approach where you could look simply at the number of birds that come to each feeder during your observation periods. You can see that he saw a number, a much, much higher number of birds coming to the tree for feeder versus the pole feeder. Um, and, and if you approach it that way, you don't even have to be able to identify bird species. So if that's something that you think might be challenging for your students or you might not have time to to get through you know, bird ID and one of these projects, you can approach it in such a way and set up the project in such a way that you might not even have to identify bird species. However, uh, Will here, he also decided to count species and his, uh, this other figure here shows the number of species he saw at each different feeder. Um, he had quite, quite a number of top to tip mice. <laughs> Another great study uh, here was by a combined kindergarten and first grade class. And they were looking at the effect of snow depth on bird counts. And so they again used that approach where you don't have to identify bird species, you can just count the number of birds. But they combined that with a skill that they were learning in that age group of measuring. Um, so they were measuring the snow depth and comparing that to the average number of birds they saw um, during those periods of, of snow depth. So there's all sorts of different ways that you can approach doing fun inquiry projects um, inspired by bird feeding. Earlier on mentioned that you can engineer your own bird feeders and how that can be a really fun way to uh, inspire some inquiry. There's really cool opportunities to you know look at different designs, see which ones birds are attracted to most to compare engineered and store-bought feeders. There's all sorts of really wonderful things that you can do. Another thing I wanted to share with you is kind of a, a big why behind why feeding birds and participating in citizen science can be a really meaningful experience for kids. So about um, three years ago now, four, I feel like I've fallen into a time warp. <laughs> um, a big paper came out in science that was looking at the number of birds in North America. And it was a, a study by folks at the lab and partners in a lot of different organizations. And they had asked the question about the total number of birds in the US. So not just species numbers, but like every bird <laughs> in the US all combined, kind of the bird biomass, if you will. Not biomass isn't the right word, but. And they found that in the 50 years since 1970, so in the span of a human lifetime, we have lost 2.9 billion birds total in the United States and Canada. That's kind of a staggering number. And what that breaks down to is about one in four birds gone since 1970. 
And this is across all, excuse me, all different sorts of bird groups. So that's kind of a big red flag to us that there is something going on with the environment's ability to support life across different habitats. But there is reason to hope. The study also found that we were seeing increases in certain groups of birds. So an increase of 15 million in raptors, an increase of 35 in water, million in waterfowl, and an increase of 14 million in woodpeckers. And all of these we could trace back to human intervention. So concentrated conservation efforts of time and money and resources were able to support these species um, and help them recover from, in the case of uh, raptors, things like DDT and habitat loss for things like waterfowl and woodpeckers. So this just goes to show that when we are aware of the problem and we put our resources to bear against it, we can make some really positive changes. And as part of this program, or excuse me, as part of this study, the organizations that did it really wanted to think about ways that everyday folks could help, that our students could help make things better for birds. And so they came up with seven simple actions for birds. Um, and this is something that you can look at with your students. Um, you can, you know, evaluate your school or your classroom and see ways that you can help. Um, so the seven simple actions for birds, Susan shared the link to uh, that in the chat window, but I wanted to highlight a couple for you. So one was make windows safer. So we talked about window collisions and bird feeders earlier. Um, there's lots of information on this about how just to make windows safer for birds in general. Um, and there's stuff in there that is absolutely doable for classrooms. Um, another one that could be fun classroom projects or uh, schoolyard projects if you have an appropriate site would be planting native plants. So if you're interested in feeding birds, you can do that through bird feeder. You can also do that by providing native plants that are great bird food sources for birds. And then the last that I wanted to highlight today is watching birds for citizen science. So participating in citizen science is one of the most powerful ways that you can help birds because this is gonna be the tool, things like eBird are gonna be the tools that help us monitor the changes that we're seeing in bird populations across um, the country and across the world. So that study I mentioned actually used citizen science data from the Christmas bird count. So this is kind of the future of, of data that monitors these big changes that we're seeing. So feeding birds and participating in citizen science can be a big part of helping us understand where things are and find some solutions. All right, so in our remaining time, I wanted to throw it back to you and see if anybody has any questions about feeding birds or the resources that I mentioned today. And while you are thinking, I did want to share that we have um, a lot of great resources on our website. So feel free to visit us there. You can also stay in touch with us on Twitter and Facebook. And we do offer letters of completion for our webinars. So if you would like a letter for one contact hour, you can send us an email at k12lab at cornell.edu and we can send that along to you. Well, hi, Janet, nice to see you. I hope you're well. Sorry, the cat just stepped on my computer and opened a window. <laughs> Um, great, I'm glad to hear that uh, you've used some of these resources and found them to be helpful. Our bird ID resources sorted by region. I'm not sure I'm, I'm going to answer that question exactly how you meant it, so please feel free to elaborate. But yeah, I think most bird ID resources like 
bird book, bird field guides and things are going to be short sorted by region. Um, one great resource I would recommend to you is the Merlin Bird ID app. This is a free app from the Cornell Lab that you can tailor to your current location. So for example, the app, if I were using it, I would set it to my city, Ithaca, New York, and it would tailor my possible sightings to that very specific location. And it does that using citizen science data from eBird. So it knows what people are reporting around me and is helping to tailor and curate a list of birds based on that. And it can even kind of tell you whether it's a common bird or whether it would be unusual to see it at that time of year. Um, so that is a great resource. I definitely recommend considering region in bird ID. It's a really important part of bird identification. And so most bird ID resources are going to take that into account. Let me know if that didn't answer your question. Has anybody, uh, okay, great. I'm glad that answered your question. Has anybody done much bird feeding and have you ever um, had a really exciting sighting? I think last year was a pretty exciting year for birds. Had some teachers reporting some winter finches. So every once in a while you'll have really fun birds coming down from like, Boreal Canada um, in an eruption year. So a year where there's a really big population boom and you might find something really exciting at your feeder. How oh, cool, Kathy had a first breasted grosbeak during migration. I'm missing some of these. <laughs> oh, you've seen swoop, hawk swoop in and grab a bird. That's always kind of like a mix of like exciting and oh no. <laughs> wow, woodpeckers feeding their young at a suet feeder. Awesome. I think the opportunities to see behaviors like this up close is such a cool teachable moment for kids. You know, you can, that hawk moment might be a little bit jarring with students, but it's also a really great opportunity to talk about life cycles and, um, how life in nature is a little bit, a little bit challenging. <laughs> it's not easy to be a bird. <laughs> oh, Nikki had a black-headed gross beak, a Western bird in Florida. It's pretty exciting. Awesome. Well, I hope that you're feeling inspired to tackle bird feeding with your students. And I hope that you have some of these magical, exciting moments with them. Please feel free to keep in touch with us and reach out if you have any further questions or send us an email if you want that letter of completion. And we hope to see you in a future webinar.